So today is, this afternoon is the wrap up of our uh, five days of inviting you to consider changing the Paris power struggle <laughs> climate of your home. If you have power struggles with your kids, if they refuse to cooperate or they ignore you, or you find yourself yelling and screaming just like your parents did, and you promised you would never do that, then I'm glad you're here. And I want to take a few questions and make sure that you know that we have a few hours still left of an open registration for the Parenting Without Power Struggles membership program. And let's see, we've got some folks on the call. If you have a question and you want me to answer it, I'm, I'm here for that. In fact, it's my favorite thing. One of my favorite things to do is to support parents. And today I was doing some writing and I was reflecting on why, why do I care so much? I'm actually not a business person. I'm not an internet marketing person. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and a credentialed teacher and a writer. I've written Parenting Without Power Struggles and Parenting with Presence with Eckhart Tolle's imprint. I, I love kids and I love parents and, and, uh, so I'm learning a lot of things to magnify the reach of our message. And many of you have been helpful in that, sharing our podcast and other things with your community, but why? And it's because I've seen what can happen when a child is raised in a really healthy, functional environment with parents who are, who are holding a place in that child's life as what I call the calm captain of the ship. And I've explained this a lot, so I don't want to repeat myself. For those of you who aren't familiar, you can find out more on the About Susan panel of my website, susanstiffelman.com. But the idea is that we hold space for our children as the one who is comfortably and confidently in charge, no matter what they're going through. And otherwise, we move into one of two other ways that we can engage with our kids. One is as the lawyer, where we're arguing and we're pushing and we're debating and we're justifying and we're negotiating and trying to convince our kids to not want what they want or to explain why they shouldn't want the thing they want or do the thing they want to do. Or we can be the dictator who rules by fear and intimidation, who overpowers their kids, who feels out of control and unappreciated much of the time and also maybe really tired and stretched. And the, when we're in dictator mode, we are threatening our kids. We're bribing them with a few more minutes on the iPad with you know, an extra cookie if they just do this thing. So there's no judgment about us being that lawyer and dictator, but I think what drives me, I know what drives me is, first of all, I was also a child once upon a time. And I wish my parents had had something like this. I wish that they had had a place to go to regularly where they could be inspired and reminded and motivated to shift out of some of the, maybe some of the less than healthy ways that they had observed their own parents, my grandparents, their parents, great grandparents, because we do tend to repeat the patterns that we inherited unless and until we make a very conscious decision to part ways with those parts of the aspects or ways of relating to our kids that no longer work for us. So we're on the call here and I have a little time with those of you who want to engage or ask a question or, or make a comment about what your own childhood was like and what you've learned. If you're in my uh, subscriber list from my website, susanstiffelman.com or on my Facebook page, you've been seeing a lot of emails, especially those of you who are getting the newsletter. We don't normally email a lot. We don't like to flood people's inboxes, but we have been reaching out with a lot of different ways of thinking about this issue, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of making a change when it seems that it's so impossible, when it seems that we are who we are and we're always going to yell or we're always going to threaten or we're always going to rely on, you know, comparing our kids to get one of them to behave as, as well as the other one. And I'm, I'm here to say that change is always possible, but, it, but we need support. We need inspiration. We need not just to read a nice parenting book, because here's the thing. I don't know if you've noticed this. In fact, if you've read a parenting book, including mine, I'd love for you to put something in the chat. You can even say the name of a book that you've read, but I know people have read my books and, and many of them have said very nice things about the books. Um, and I've read a lot of parenting books. You just can't believe how many parenting books I've read. So there's a lot of books out there and a lot of online programs and classes. And, 
and you, you'll read a thing that says, when your child does X, you should do Y. Say it this way. When your child refuses to look up, say this thing. And in the book, when the author is giving an anecdote of how Sally had the, you know, her son refused to do this thing. And then she said it this way. And she said these words. And then suddenly S S Sally's son was cleaning up his room. So you read that and you go, wow, maybe I should say da, 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 da. And my son will clean up his room or my kids will cooperate. And then it doesn't work. Can I hear an amen if you've had that experience? You read something, you think, um, somebody says, are you, are you kidding me, Jeannie? I have 41 parenting books behind me. <laughs> oh yeah. I love masterminds and wingmen by Rosalind Weisman. We've done some stuff together. I really like her. She's been on a few of my summits. Um, okay. So she's not kidding. 41 parenting books. Here's the problem with that. And this is from the author of a popular parenting book. It's not what you say to your child that makes the difference. It's, it's the energy and who you are as you're delivering the information. So our kids are so bright and they're so tuned in and they're so sensitive and they're finely attuned to our state. And when they sense in us that that dictator who's desperate and needy or, or for them to behave a certain way so that we can feel like we're good parents, or at least like we're not failing. When there's a neediness in us, or when we come at our kids as the lawyer and we're arguing and defending and justifying, our kids sense that insecurity and that lack of solidity. And it evokes in them a response different from what you read in the book, right? And that's why people, I can't, I've been doing this for over 40 years, seriously, well over 40 years in one form or another. I've been a licensed therapist for over 30 years. I've been a teacher for well over 40. I was an educational therapist. I homeschooled my own son, that, which is kind of a nice element for our membership program because I can also speak to educational and academic learning style issues. But who we are is conveyed not in the words, but in everything else. It's called meta. M-E-T-A, the meta communication, the subtler aspects of how we communicate with our kids when, we're, when we make a request. Are we that, Gordon Neufeld talks about being the North Star, being that alpha presence in the child's life and, and not needy, not desperate, not shaming, not humiliating, but open and, and able to allow the child to feel all the feels, you know, frustration, disappointment, fear, worry, anxiety, without rushing in to try and talk them out of those, those uh, ideas or feelings or rushing in to threaten or bribe them to get them to behave a certain way so that we don't feel that we're you know, ruining them or we don't feel judged by others. So if any of this makes sense, I'd love to, to hear from you in the comments or in the chat box. And if you have a question, you know the purpose of today is as always to connect with you, but it's also the final event of our five-day focus on helping parents find out about our Parenting Without Power Struggles membership program. We meet twice a month. We just had our first of October's uh, meeting this morning. Such a great conversation. We had topics on everything from, oh gosh, Amy, maybe you could put some things in the chat, but we, you know, a seven-year-old who worries that her stomach is too big an eight-year-old who has meltdowns unless somebody sits with him when he does assignments he's very capable of doing, a 16-year-old who withdraws into kind of depression and um, when she's frustrated, just folds into herself, a child with anger, you know, explosive anger who got in trouble for shoving another child who was sort of egging him on. So this is what we deal with every two weeks. I answer questions and I do coaching with parents. And it's so inspiring to me because in some cases, we have parents who have been in the program for several years and others, you know, just, just recently joined. And, um, but I, it lifts me up because I see what we're doing as parents from a much bigger uh, lens than can I get my kid to put her shoes on and do his homework. 
I know for a lot of you, that's the focus of your day. Can I just not have another meltdown? Can we just get through the day without a meltdown? Can we just get through the day where my, my child will do his homeschooling thing and not go and hide under the table when his class is in session? Can we just have a day when I can get my kid to brush his teeth and get his pajamas on without a nightmare uh, explosion? I know that that's your reality and I, I'm here to support you. That's why I do this work. But I also want to invite you to, to look at what you do every day from a broader point of view. Because as I was saying earlier, my parents raised me, they, they did their best. There were some things that they could have done better. And if they had had access to something like this, resources like our program, I think I might have been spared some painful experiences and been more resilient and sturdy and resourceful as a young adult. I actually still have my mother with me, She's not in my home, but I, I saw her two days ago. My mother's 99 and it's just a love fest. We talk to her every night and then I got to see her uh, a few days ago. And, and so it's a very healed and loving, loving, loving relationship. But there's still, you know, when I was younger, it's like, I wish my parents had known certain things, but I can also tell you that the things that my mother instilled within me and I got to tell her this the other day. Um, they, they influenced who I became. They influenced the person that I became, the woman that I became, the speaker and the teacher that I became. So we have such an opportunity to raise our children into men and women who will guide the next generation. And we need good leaders, you guys. We need the children we're raising right now to have the experience on a day in and day out basis, at least some of the time of being, of listening to others, of developing greater resilience and tolerance of more flexibility and adaptability of creative and outside the box thinking of feeling empowered to forge their own path of feeling seen and celebrated for who they are, not just how they behave or what they accomplish. And you guys are in the driver's seat of that. It's such a privilege. It's such an amazing opportunity to literally save the planet, <laughs> to raise these little ones under your care, to become conscious, caring, compassionate, com competent leaders of a very soon to come generation. So it was such a, a joy for me to be able to thank my mother for the, way, the ways she helped me be who I am and someone who wants to do the work I do. And then you could find example after example of people. And it doesn't mean they have to go out and be big speakers, just how they show up in their neighborhood, how they show up in their own family as a father and mother. You get to influence that. So let's see, I think we have a couple of comments here. Uh, my dad had the right answer to everything. I don't feel like a North Star. My son says that everyone else in ninth grade stays up till midnight during the week. I'm torn between wanting him to belong and wanting him to sleep no decisive North Star here. Yeah, I get that. And um, I like the, word, the fact that you use the word decisive because until we are pretty clear about where we stand, our kids will push back. So I would invite you, I don't know if you're asking, but I would certainly invite you to get clear about what time the, the digital devices go off or the router gets turned off and then prepare for the storm prepare for your ninth grade youngster to hate you, think you're stupid, tell you how unfair you are. And this is something I, I probably, Amy, you could probably, uh, Amy is my incredibly wonderful assistant and helper. And I, I'm guessing that she would agree that in every call, every two weeks, we talk about screen time because it's, you need propping up week after week. You need a lot of support around this because a lot of you are trying to establish guidelines that are unique to your community. Not that many people are trying to hold their kids, you know, keep more boundaries, they've given up. So my kids are 11 and 13. My biggest two challenges are back talk, especially when requested to help with chores and with screen time management. I watched Social Dilemma and watched your live discussion on the film, good stuff. We have pretty strict limits on screen use, but especially with COVID and screens being such a a way they're connecting with their peers. I struggle to completely cut out their ways of connecting with friends. Um, it's funny you should say that because I just got off a call 
an hour long call with Tristan Harris, who is one of the key featured uh, players in the film, The Social Dilemma. And I cannot recommend that film more highly. And I think later in this month, we're gonna do another discussion, hopefully with one of the other um, people featured in the film. It's, it's so important. And I think it's one of the best ways of helping your kids understand what the, the nature of the beast and the reason that screens are of concern to you and not to screens but social media. So I, I don't know if you watch that with your kids, but I, <laughs> I talked to somebody the other day who watched it with their seven-year-old. I was saying, oh, maybe around 10 on up, but um, it's really important that we open the eyes of our children so that they understand how they're being exploited and manipulated. And at the same time, I totally get that this is one of the only ways that a lot of our kids can connect with their friends. So you set limits and you say, okay, you get this period of time and then you have this long of a break. We can negotiate that together as long as you're you're respectful and we're having a a, a a mutually respectable respectful conversation. If you explode and make demands, then the conversation will be over. Just sharing that, I assume this is the place to not bring out feeling like a North Star. I'm sorry, could you just I want to answer that. I think there's a question there, so I'm just not quite understanding it. Uh, just sharing that, I assume. This is the place to bring out, bring, okay, I'll wait till you, till you elaborate because I, I think uh, there might be something that you wanna ask there. If you have any other questions, if you have a question for me or you wanna ask a question about the, the membership, Amy, would you mind putting in the chat? Cause I always forget all the things that people get when they join. I know that you're getting the two calls. Once a month, we're now gonna have a, a watch party. You don't have to attend, but we're gonna watch a really cool dialogue that I've had and then you, whoever shows up can discuss it. So you're feeling more of a sense of community with other like-minded, like-hearted parents. Uh, we're having a surprise cool thing this week for all our new members where you can meet each other. There's two different times that that's being offered. And then if you want to, to start looking toward uh, finding an accountability partner or a listening partner, that's available. And you get a lot of bonuses, this amazing conversation I had with Byron Katie on co-parenting, but of course it spilled over into a lot of other aspects of parenting. And I think 50% off some of our great best master classes. So all of that stuff is available. And I think, yeah, if you have a question about either the membership program or you just wanna ask me something about parenting, I'm so inspired by what's going on in this community of the, um, speaking of the social dilemma that the film on Netflix, and it sort of harks to the fact that um, we are on a runaway train with, with screens and our kids, and nobody knows what to do, how to slow things down, how to set reasonable limits. And that's why I really feel like we have to keep having these conversations together. Susan, do you think this is applicable to ADHD kids? Um, are you asking about the social dilemma or the membership program? I kind of have a subspecialty in ADHD. Membership, oh yeah, we talk about that a lot and I'm diagnosed by the way, ADHD. I see it actually, the reason I, I call it ADD-ish, um, I don't believe it's a deficit. I definitely don't think that people with the behaviors and characteristics of attention, ADHD ha ha have a deficit of attention. And I don't see it as a disorder. In fact, I would venture to say <clears throat> that my ADD-ish uh, qualities have greatly enhanced my life. Oh my gosh, <laughs> my life is so much better because I'm wired that way. And I've had to do a lot of learning in terms of how I manage myself when I'm not highly stimulated and engaged, when I have something dreary and monotonous to do, when I'm bored, when I don't wanna sit still at, and do something that requires sitting still. So yes, we talk about that. And I, I love talking about ADHD because these kids, here's an example of what it's like to be a child who's constantly being told, sit down, focus, can't you pay attention? This, this, you could get this assignment done in 10 minutes if you just sat and did it instead of three hours. Um, why do you always procrastinate and put things off? Can't you leave your brother alone? So imagine that I uh, that somebody touches touches my arm very lightly. You can't tell, but I'm just very lightly touching, right? 
Now, if you do that 10, 20 times, it's no big deal. But I want you to imagine what would happen if I touched this exact same spot 50,000 times, right? Over and over and over and over, lightly, but every over and over and over. Eventually you would have a bruise because it's, it's just getting, in, having impact, even if it's light for such a long time. And I see this sometimes with the kids who are diagnosed with attention or impulsivity issues that the cumulative impact of, Johnny, can't you just focus, just sit down. This would be so easy if you just pay attention. Why did you have to get up? Can't you stop interrupting? Why didn't you get started sooner? Okay, so these are just single little sentences or questions and they, they may have a legitimate origin, but it's the constancy of it that these kids end up shrinking in on themselves unless they, they are really supported and, and unless we as parents understand their, their sort of brain chemistry and neurological uh, challenges. So I, that's a very long answer <laughs> to the question, but Amy did put the membership page in the, um, you're very welcome, in the link. And, and just to make sure you know, uh, it's very likely that when we relaunch this next, probably at the beginning of the year, it will come at a higher rate, but whoever's a member now, you lock in the rate that it currently is forever until you drop out. I'm just gonna read the page again and see if there's anything I wanna add about the membership. You talk about becoming a parent who doesn't yell, but how literally, including in the moment after your patient runs out? That's a really good question. Okay. So human beings, we have thresholds. We have, a, we have our limit, right? And yelling is a, it's sort of a survival. Now, it, I don't know if you're yelling because your kids have really pushed you, pushed and pushed and pushed, or you're yelling, maybe you could clarify, you're yelling because that's the only thing they listen to. They tune you out unless you escalate. Maybe you can put that in the chat and let me know which of those. Sometimes we yell at our kids just because somebody spilled one thing too many. And okay, so mostly it's that they don't listen unless you yell, yeah. So we train our children, we train our kids um, to tune us out and we train them to need a certain threshold of intensity and drama to actually get their attention. And that can be untrained. But instead of telling you how to not yell in the moment, which is just not what I'm about, I'm gonna to talk to you about what fuels the, the frustration in you and how to override the child's instinct to ignore you. So, and I'm just gonna to touch on it, but this is like one of the cornerstones of my work. So let me just say a little bit about it. The first piece is that we tend to yell when we're believing um, a narrative about what our child's ignoring means, right? If, you're if you've asked your child five times to come to dinner, then the little lawyers in your head, and you have little lawyers, um, those little lawyers start building a case of why your child should come to dinner, why he doesn't appreciate all you do for him, why he's so, so entitled, why, why no one, you know, everyone takes advantage of you, and it's going to heat you up. And so you're going to be more reactive because you're unloading not only about this particular scenario, you're calling your kids to dinner, but all the other stuff gets piled in on that of all the times that people don't appreciate you. Maybe not just your children, maybe your partner, maybe your boss, your coworker. So it, it, it becomes an outlet for a lot of pent up frustration inside of us when we yell at our kids. But to the point of the, the second point, when I want you to, ask a different question. I want you to ask the question, when do your children do what you ask without you having yelled? And you can put that in the chat because it's really important to, to build on success and not just tell me what the thing to say is and I'll do it. Somebody says, you, um, a question about membership. Is there a term commitment? Oh no, it's just month to month. Yeah, you can just sign up for a month, see how you like it. Still get the bonuses and drop out if you want. Um, so I'm waiting to see, you know, and any of you can respond to this. When, when do you not have to yell at your kids? Not sure. I spent a, a lot of quality time with them and thought we were really connected, but no change. In fact, more. Interesting. Okay. So quality time and connection does not um, minimize the likelihood that they're going to ignore you when you make a request. 
could you then say, is the request always about the same kind of thing? Is it always about getting them to turn off a device? Is it always about getting them to go to bed? Is it always about getting them out of bed? Is there a pattern? We're always looking for patterns. Is it a certain time of day? My kids listen when I tell them I'll take away electronics for 24 hours. Yeah, no yelling, but yeah. Um, that one person says it's always about not wasting time and she puts in a smiley face, usually getting schoolwork done. Okay. So then we look at the underlying issue. We look at what the child's objection is. And this is what I call, for those of you familiar with my work or my books, we, I call it act one parenting. Because in my world, what I do in my coaching calls and in my private sessions, and it's always about looking for the root. So we become detectives. I like the fact that you were able to narrow this down from, they just, I just always have to yell to, okay, let me think about it. Let me reflect. It tends to be about schoolwork. Okay, now we have something more, more to work with and something that we can show up for that child as the captain of the ship, as opposed to the lawyer. So my hands, I'll just do it. My hand, right hand represents the parent. It's above the child's hand when I'm in captain mode. When my hands are side by side, I'm in lawyer mode. Nobody's in charge. And when my hand's below the child, I'm in dictator mode. I'm, I feel out of control and desperate, so I'm trying to overpower the child. So the captain is the one that kids would turn to when they're struggling to get their homework done. And instead of just get it done already, it would take you five minutes if you would just focus. We might, and not every time, but we might say, buddy, looks like you're really having a hard time getting started on that assignment. And I noticed that you've been ignoring me. Tell me, tell me about what's going on. And we, we speak in brief phrases because we tend to flood our kids with long lectures. Like we almost get excited that, oh, I get to tell you all my, share all my wisdom with you about procrastination and about having a can-do attitude. And I was joking with somebody the other day about we often assume that our children want our pearls of wisdom. We often assume that they have signed up for our class. And I said, just imagine, imagine me going out on the street right now, just going out on the street and cornering somebody on the street, taking a walk and saying, let me, and making them, giving them the lecture I'm giving you guys right now, giving them the talk about parenting and power struggles and frustration and all this. And I grab somebody on the street and I start, make them stand still and I give them, I speak to them what I'm saying to all of you right now. And that person starts squirming and they wanna kind of get away because they, they didn't ask. I'm just forcing them to listen. And I said, no, no, wait, I just wanted to say one more thing about parenting, it's really important. And they're looking at me like, I didn't, I didn't ask for this, I'm not interested. And, I'm, and then they start to try and leave again. I say, hey, you know what? That's not, you're not, I just really want you to listen to this one last thing. Can you imagine? Because the problem is we often corner our kids with lectures before they signed up for our class. They're not open. They're not receptive to our guidance. That's why so much of the work we do is at the root level, fostering connection as somebody pointed out and also showing up as the captain of the ship with act one parenting to offset and offload frustration, confusion, worry, you know, feeling at a loss for how to handle something that feels difficult or challenging. We show up as that calm, confident captain of the ship and it's funny how our kids suddenly can hear us. It's funny how they are now open and more receptive to our guidance, somebody says. Okay, I'm gonna put my glasses on. How do you feel your philosophy on parenting is similar or different from lo love and logic? I've done some love and logic parenting classes and audiobooks and have the logic, natural consequences, not yelling side down pretty well. But I struggle with the love and empathy side. Whenever I say, oh, bummer, or try to empathize, it sounds sarcastic because at the root, I am thinking, what did you think would happen when you did that? <laughs> That's great, yeah. Um, I'm not a love and logic person. I don't have the training. I, I, I know that people who have followed that work have told me that my work is, is quite a bit different. It works for some people. And um, I'm not a, opposed to natural consequences with kids. You know, somebody has been just horrible and I was gonna take them 
to the friend's house. I say, yeah, I just don't, I'm not feeling it, sweetheart. You know, maybe, maybe we can try this again tomorrow. That's a natural consequence of somebody being really rude and unpleasant toward me. Yeah, I don't really feel like driving them somewhere. But I'm not as formulaic as that. Um, I think you could say that I'm working at a deeper level because not only are we working to create a really deep and authentic and vulnerable relationship with our kids to show them what that looks like, and to, it's also healing for us. So it's not really just, can I get this thing done at the end today? Can I get them to do their homework? It's really, it is that for sure. It's about getting shoes on and getting homework done and getting kids to do their chores. I, I'm super, super practical about the work that I do. But um, we can sometimes fracture or compromise the relationship we have with our kids when it's all about a technique or a strategy to convince them or compel them to do the things we want. So that's my, my answer on that. We're gonna wrap up here in a minute. Somebody is laughing about my analogy of going out on the street and says to her credit, congratulations, her kids are surprisingly good about putting up with my wisdom. That's, something's going well. So before we wrap up, I'd love for you to put something in the chat about what you think your greatest parenting strength is or your greatest parenting success. Let's just have a minute to not, not just talk about the problems because I think we sell ourselves short and we often focus exclusively on what's not going well, what we should do differently or better. And part of what I'm after in the work that I do in an ongoing way with parents is changing that internal dialogue because when all you think about when you put your head down on the pillow is what didn't go well, what you should have done differently, how you blew it, how you lost your way, lost your cool, it's kind of demoralizing. And it also puts your kids in charge of your sense of competency and success and well being. If you need them to behave a certain way so that you can feel you're doing a job, let me just see what you can give yourself the gift right now of here's how I showed up today or this week in a way that I feel good about, whether or not it resulted in your kids putting on their shoes or helping with the dishes, just referencing yourself, giving yourself that acknowledgement because we don't get it very often and we're so hard on ourselves and parenting is pretty impossible. So I'm waiting for something in the chat because like, come on y'all. A little kindness toward ourselves can go a long way. It's actually very healing. So I encourage you to volunteer something that you're pleased about. I give it a minute. Ooh, it's getting warm. Ah, who's going to be brave and share something? I'm happy about taking on the parenting challenge happily. I don't wish away this opportunity. I work really hard on parenting. Well, thank you for sharing that. I love that phrase. I don't wish away this opportunity. I've done a number of sessions with people like John Kabat-Zinn and uh, Jack Cornfield and both of them have used this phrase that you're, when you're raising children, you're really living with your little Zen masters. So we will learn and grow by hook or by crook. Our kids are incredible teachers for us. Somebody says, I bond with my kids at bedtime with reading books and cuddling and great conversations in the dark. Yeah, excellent. Let's see what somebody put in here. I read PET um, and some other parenting books and have tried some of these strategies with varying degrees of success. I worry that my inconsistency has emboldened my five and seven year old children to be more defiant and question my ability to guide them. I don't want to confuse them further. How will the membership program help? Hmm. Um, parent effectiveness training is PET and that was a very popular book. Um, so I guess one of the, the, yes, when you talk about your inconsistency, I think what she's saying and correct me if I'm wrong is if you sometimes say, yes, you can have this thing. And sometimes you say, no, you can't have this thing. There's an idea in the parenting world that we need to be consistent. And um, I'm here to say that I don't think we can always be consistent. I don't think it's hum humanly possible. But I would say that there are times when um, our waffling, like when we're not clear and then we make a, a direction, we offer a direction or a request to our kids and they know that we may change our mind if they pitch a fit. 
we're, we're going to stay in that cycle. So I would say that the membership, one of the things people tell me is that because they can either watch the session, join the session every couple of weeks or watch the replay. And by the way, a lot of people, very, very few people join the live session and not that many people watch all of the replay. People tell me even if they watch five minutes or they play it in the background and they're making dinner or they're folding laundry or they're doing something that, that allows them to play some audio in the background, that they take in some of the ideas and it reinforces because of the repetition. And I think this is the most important feature of the program in terms of inconsistency is that because you, we do these things in bursts, okay, you read a book and you get inspired or you take a, a little class or go to a summit and you get really inspired. I've done a lot of those summits, but it's the day in and day out where we need the propping up. It's the day in and day out where we need to be reminded and inspired again and again and again to override the old baked in ways that we have of reacting, whether it's what we inherited from our own parents in childhood or just the, the, the ways that we scramble to make things up as we go with our parents. So I think that um, the membership really helps because you have, you're accountable. Every couple of weeks, you're gonna be reminded whether it's in an email or it's watching a few minutes of a video or joining the session or coaching with me, which you can also do sometimes. And then there's also the option of having an accountability partner that's gonna open up this week. Oh, somebody, another positive here is sometimes I can bring compassion to both of us when we're struggling. I think that's sort of, that's sort of one of the biggest pieces is, is to really recognize when our kids are misbehaving or struggling or acting out, they're just like us, you know, they're struggling. I love Ross Green's work and we've done some classes together and he talks about lagging skills and unmet needs. And we address that sometimes in the membership because children who feel close to you want to behave well for you. That's just human nature. So either we look at the connection, the relationship, or we look at the skills that they're missing or a need that isn't being met and we address it in that way at the root. I hope this has been valuable and interesting to you. I mean, I love talking about parenting and I love working with parents. And um, if, if you know this program resonates for you and you wanna give it a try, there's no obligation. You can just try it for a month and, and check it out. And um, somebody just signed up. That's so great. I'm so glad to have you with us. Um, and somebody has a question for Amy. So Amy, can you um, help, help her with that? Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll set you right on that. Don't worry about it. Um, I can't, okay. <laughs> uh, just email support at susanstiffelman.com if you wanna reach Amy and she can help you with that. All right, love. All right, you guys be kind to yourselves. Focus on the positive. If I can help you, I'm here. And if, if not, you know, we'll circle back around and this will open up again next year, I'm sure. I'm pretty sure, I think it will. Anyway, it's open right now. And if you'd like to join me and um, we'd love to have you. Thank you guys. All the best to everyone. Very excited. I'm so glad you're here with us. Mm -hmm.